Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Pastor Jack with my wife Joyce. And we have some truth today that I believe is going to help you in a great way. I want to minister to you today on the topic of staying on top of it. And what I mean by that is this. When you're believing God's word and you're believing for those dreams and those visions that God has promised us, if you can't stay on top of it spiritually, you begin to consider this, consider that, and before long you get depressed and you begin to doubt. And we know if you doubt, you go without. And so the challenge is, if we can learn in the Word how to stay on top of it, even when you're hearing bad news, what do we do? How do we do it? Well, it's, it's a challenge. Many times it's a challenge because we live in a world that is so full of voices and so full of of things that are happening so fastly, you know, it's, it's hard to process. Even the good things is hard to process. You know, life just, is just really a vapor, as the Bible says. But, you know, it, it says that we walk by faith and not by sight. And, and our physical senses are always so dominating, so strong. That's why we have to continually be disciplined and feed into God's Word. Because if you don't have God's Word, that's going to be your dominating force then when all these voices and it doesn't take a lot you know can blindside you and get you off the path and and then it's just that much harder you know to, to stay on top of it so once you get your Bibles open call up a friend get your iced tea out coffee whatever and and hear this word today allow it to get down into your spirit and then begin to say Lord how can I apply this in my life and I'll tell you what because Christians should be the most happiest people on the face of this earth. We have everything in our corner. We have the Holy Spirit, but because we don't renew our minds sometimes, it becomes a real struggle and we don't see the victory. And we're believing that you're going to not only get on top of it, you're going to stay on top of your circumstances in your life. Father, bless us as we get into this in Jesus' name. Father, bless them today. Father, as this word goes forth, Give them an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Father, enable them and, and minister to them, Lord, by your power and your grace. We thank you for everyone that will be healed, everyone that will be set free, everyone that will be delivered, and we give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. You can be seated, everybody. Thank you, Lord. Love staying on top of it. Amen. Well, let's get in the Word today. And so if you got your Bibles, open up to 1 John chapter 1. And I want to take several of the verses here in the first chapter to explain this because I believe to, be on, to stay on top of it, you have to stay in fellowship with God. And so I want to talk about this this morning. And I believe it will make a significant difference in your faith. And so let's look at the beginning, what he says. That which was from the beginning, which you have heard, which you have uh, seen with our eyes, which have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was the, with the Father and was manifest to the Son. Now, I want to emphasize the eternal life because I want you to understand what eternal life is, Okay. People, most people say eternal life is living forever. Anyone that is a human being has a spirit, and their spirit will live forever. It's where it lives is what we want to do. We want to make sure we live in heaven. Amen? But eternal life in Scripture, that is not emphasized. What is emphasized is what it actually means. And, and if you can write this down as an example, in John 17, verse, I believe it is 3, Jesus himself explains what eternal life is. He says eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. So eternal life is to have a relationship with God and know him. Amen? And you see that emphasized all through the uh, uh, first John. In fact, if you look in first John 2 verse 3, it says, By this we know that we know him. So it's emphasizing knowing God all through the book. Amen? And so in his first chapter, he's talking about, listen, when we walked with Jesus, we, his manifestation of life was in our life. We experienced it. We were blessed by it. And we want you to share in the same thing. So he's talking about a fellowship with God. Let's go on in the text, please. That which we have seen and heard declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be made full. And so the whole chapter is talking about 
how do I get these people in a relationship with God where they're in fellowship all the time? Because if you want to stay on top of it spiritually, you're going to have to be in fellowship with God. Can you say amen? amen? Now, God always wants to fellowship with you. But sometimes we, because of sin and rebellion, we don't do what he wants to do. And he will not fellowship with us until we get in agreement with his word. Amen? So let's go on in the next verse. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Say this with me. In him is no, is no darkness at all. At all. Now, how many know if you believed on Christ, you're in him? Amen. Isn't that right? But there's a difference between being in him and abiding in him. When you abide in him, you're abiding in the light in him. That means that your sins have been dealt with and everything else, and you're abiding in him. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, look at the next verse, because he deals with people in the church that have a different perspective. And we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness or excuse me let me say it again if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth now he's telling us then that if you say you have fellowship with god and you're not walking or practicing the truth you are a liar now i know that all of us have met people like that maybe they were at the church one time and and you see him, you know, at a restaurant or whatever, you're talking to him. How you doing, man? How you been? I haven't seen you for months. How come you haven't been in church and all that? And said, well, I still got a great relationship with God. I'm doing good. You know, I, I'm living with my girlfriend. But I, but I pray every day, and I know, I know Jesus and all this stuff. They're liars. You can't walk with God if you're in sin. Say Amen. amen. It doesn't matter how sincere they sound or whatever. Oh, I'm praying, whatever. I'm not going to church, but I'm praying. If you're not doing the will of God, you're not in fellowship with God. And if you're not in fellowship with God, you cannot get on top of your situation spiritually. God may be knocking on the door wanting to come in and minister to you, but you can't, you can't get that power and know him in your trial, in your turmoil and all that unless you are doing what wor the word of God says. Amen? And look at the next verse, or the next verse, and notice how he says it. But if we walk in the light, now notice, walking is practicing the word, right? It's explained in the verse before that if you walk, that if you say you're in fellowship with God and walk in darkness, you're a liar. So walking means you're practicing the word. So he says if we walk in the light or practice the word, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, not only with each other, but with God. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, the question about the verse that has come up is this. Okay. If we're being cleansed of our sin, then obviously we must have sin in our lives. But if you're walking with God and obeying God, there wouldn't be any sin, so you'd have no need to be cleansed of sin. Isn't that right? But here, here's a perspective that sometimes we miss, and that is this. Even when you're walking in the light that you know that you're in, there is still sin in your life. There are secret sins. Those, those things in your life that you weren't aware of, that you were doing, that were wrong, it's still sin. Are you following me? And so it says that, that if you walk in the light, he's in the light. In other words, according to the illumination of light that God gives you, if you walk in that, God will cleanse you from those secret sins. Let me show you another verse about secret sins. Uh, Psalms, flip it up if you would, uh, 19, verse 12 through 13. Here David reveals it. Who can understand his errors? Talking about himself. Cleanse me from my secret faults. He's talking about things that he may be doing wrong in his life that he's not aware of. And then he goes on. Keep me back, uh, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Those are ones that you intentionally do. And let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Can you say amen, everybody? Amen. And so I bring this out because... I believe that many times we're looking too lightly at sin in our life that we commit. And we think it's not that big of a deal. It breaks fellowship with God. If, the, if you're in unforgiveness towards somebody, it breaks fellowship with God. If you're robbing God of your tithes and offerings, it breaks fellowship with God. If you're lying about people, you're breaking fellowship with God. If you're committing uh, fornication, you are breaking fellowship with God. In other words, whatever sin it may be in your life, if you don't repent of it, you're not going to have the relationship with God that you need to prevail. You can't get on top of the situation until you get in agreement with God. Two cannot walk together unless they be in agreement. 
God will not walk with us unless we get in agreement with his standards, his principles in the Word. Can you say amen, everybody? And so I want to be in that condition. And so here's what I do. I, I don't, uh, everything that I, I, I know that, that I do, that even on my best day, and I feel like I'm fairly spiritual, even on my best day, I can look back and go, boy, you know, I probably shouldn't have done that either. And there's always things that you say and whatever. All that's covered by the blood. But when you defiantly know the word and you don't do it, you're in a position that you need to say, Lord, I'm sorry, I screwed up. And then God will forgive you and cleanse you. And then you'll be in a spot where you can know God. I remember when I first got saved, I'd be in the shower and said, Lord, help me today, Lord. And, and, or be in the evening, whatever. And i say, Lord, thank you for helping me today with some of, some of the weaknesses in my life. And every, every day of my life, I wanted to make sure I was in the right relationship with God. And so I grew to know God because I was doing that. But a lot of people don't see the need of that anymore. They think, well, God knows I'm human, obviously. And we don't take it seriously enough when John took it very seriously. He's telling the church, don't tell me that you know God. Don't tell me you've got fellowship with God if you're not practicing the truth. I imagine they're going, whoa, this is heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. Yeah, but pastor, that was Jesus. He's preaching under the law. I want to tell you something about Jesus preaching. He preached grace. Grace. What he taught was not in the law. It went beyond the law. Everything that he taught was beyond the law. And you can find every teaching that he did in the Sermon on the Mount, you can find it in the epistles, which is after the cross. You can find James saying, don't swear by anything. Just like Jesus said, don't swear by your head. Same thing. Same stuff. Paul said, put to death the lust of the flesh. Jesus said, don't even look on a woman to lust for her. Same stuff. To disregard that is to disregard the words of Jesus. Amen? And he's the author of my faith. But to give you an epistle, if you're a little squirmish, James 2.13 says this, that judgment will be without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Same principle. Same principle. You better be nice to your pastor. You better be nice to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen? God forgive you of all your sins. Man, we got so much to be thankful for. There's no reason why we should ever, ever be in a negative situation like that. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 2. Look what it says. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you, now remember, this is Paul. He wrote one-third of the New Testament, talked on grace more than anybody else. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in, in which you stand. Now notice he's talking about standing. Look at the next verse. By which also you were saved, if you hold fast. Say it with me. If... I hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Which vain means this, that your faith never produced results. Isn't that good? I said, isn't that good, everybody? And there's more to that. There's more. Let me give you another one. I mean, the Bible's full of it, and we, we just, we bypass it. We don't look at it. We got to endure it all the way to the end. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14 says this. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Hallelujah. Hold on. Hold on. Don't let the world deceive you. Don't let the world mess you up. Praise God. Amen. Okay. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Look at this verse. Paul's ministering to the people at, at Philippi, and he's encouraging them, I want you to obey God when you're in my presence and when you're not in my presence and he gives them an ingredient that will help you obey God look what he says therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in your, my absence work out say work out didn't say work for but work out your own salvation with not in but with fear and trembling not in fear and trembling but with fear and trembling now, why does he say that? Because fear and trembling in the scripture is used to have a, a reverence towards God's word. To the point that you think to yourself, if I don't do it, 
these consequences will be so severe, I got to do it. The fear of the godly fear comes from Scripture. In fact, let me show you a verse. Uh, Jeremiah 32, verse 40. I don't know if they have it up on the screen. Uh, if, is it coming up? No. Okay, Jeremiah 32, verse 40. And you'll see the, see the purpose of the f godly fear. Uh, Jeremiah 32... Did it, did it appear? Okay. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Isn't that good? That I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear, catch this, in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. In other words, here's what it is. Let me give you an example. The Bible says that death and life is in the power of the tongue. Right? Right? So if I'm standing in faith for something and I hear myself speak death concerning, the first thing I think about, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I just stopped the blessing that I had released in my life by the words that I said. Because I believe that God's word is inerrant, infallible. I believe whatever God's word says, and God's word says this, that anyone that doubts, let that, person, let that person not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. Man, when I hear that, I go, okay, Lord. I can't doubt. If I doubt, I go without. And so this, this reverence of God's word causes you to realize, wait a minute, the way he's a sinner, death. If I don't put to death my flesh, I'm going to experience death in my life. And that causes you to draw back from the sin and turn to God. There's two things that produce obedience, love and the fear of the Lord. If you got one without the other, you don't have enough. Because there's time, and I'll tell you, we, we, we haven't experienced in this generation, but the apostles did. The apostles, they were crucified upside down. They were boiled in oil. They, the disciples were... They took animal skins and put them on and fed them to, to the lions. These were people that many of them had to cost their life to follow Jesus. And they didn't just do it because they loved Jesus. They were afraid of what would happen if they denied him. And, and that is why they stood strong and didn't give, back, give, give, give way. In fact, I'm a little bit irked about the American church. You know why? Because we have embraced doctrine that came from men instead of doctrine that came from the word and we call it the word we've, we've embraced Calvinism which came not from an apostle but from someone just like me and you Paul, he, John Calvin Arminianism didn't come from the apostles he came from men the early church never taught that you could live any way you wanted to live and then go to heaven Calvinism didn't even appear for 300 years. 300 years. And you read, read the church fathers, and they all said, if you don't do the word of God, you're going to go to hell. But we've taken the doctrine of men and made it as if it was the doctrine of the apostles. What does the word say? The word says we're to hold fast. The word says to endure to the end, you'll be saved. That's what we need to adhere to. And even though we can't understand everything because it is a mystery, a lot of it, we don't chuck it out because someone seems to have some spiritual insight to it that it is endorsed by Scripture. We're seeing all over America people lukewarm in their faith, lukewarm in their obedience, lukewarm in following God, and all I can say is there's got to be something missing. The love of God's been preached till you're blue in the face. There must be the fear of God must be not being preached. There must be an aspect of Christianity that they're not seeing in Scripture and they think it's all right to live with my girlfriend. It's all right to do this. It's all right if I never go to church. It's all right if I take the drugs. It's all right if I do that. It's not all right at all. You need to obey God and follow Him with the best of your ability and not give way to that kind of stuff. As you can tell, I'm a little bit worked up about this. Because I just want to do my part for the kingdom. Amen? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
Let me show you one verse and we'll close with it. My wife tells me, she says, you need to be a little bit positive when you do your last verse. Look at this, John 15, verse 7. Jesus told this to disciples that hadn't left him. The blood of Judas had already left. These were people that gave up everything to follow Jesus. He said, if you abide in me. Now, we know when we come to Christ, we're in him, right? But to abide in him is not the same as being in him. When you abide in him, and that's a verb, by the way, that means that you have to walk in the light that he gives you to abide in him. And my word abide in you. He, then he says, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. What a promise. What a promise God has given us if we would simply walk in fellowship with him and follow the word to the best of our ability. And when we mess up, tell him we messed up. But agree with his word and follow his word in his life. He said, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven to you. And you can ask what's in your heart and I will bless you with it. Because number one, you got God's word in your heart. So what you're asking for is going to be good. I was pondering all these things and I, uh, there was a question that, ca that came up in mind. It's come up many times and the question was this. If God disciplines us, and he does many times to the point that we have premature death, then how could anyone as a believer ever, ever go down that path that he would commit the sin unto death and, and, be, and die spiritually and be totally separated from God for the rest of his eternity? And I thought about that and thought about it, and, and then all of a sudden it became so clear to me, as long as you're in the house, the discipline of the Lord can be operating in your life because the word is preached. Amen? But it, I could compare it to this. In the Bible, the man that was sleeping with his father's stepmother, he kept going to church when Paul said, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He was going to church every time, every Sunday or whatever they had church at that time. And so he was dealing with someone who didn't want to abandon his faith. Can you say amen? Let me say it to you this way. You got some young people, they're living in your house. But they've turned 18. And you got your house rules, you can't do this, you can't do this. And what do they do if they, if they don't want to do those rules anymore? They move out. Once they move out, there's no way you can discipline them. Only when they're in the house. Church, we have to take serious God's word. You can know God and end up losing him if you take the wrong path. Especially if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost like me. You haven't been touched by God to the degree I have been. And that's different. Most people, there's always hope. But I'm just telling you, this is a serious thing. We need to be believers. And if we're going to believe for big things, let's walk in fellowship with God. I don't want to deal with someone that's living a sinful life and he's believing, oh, I'm going to make all this money. Well, you're wasting your time. Start living for God first. Then we'll agree in faith. That doesn't mean you'll ever be perfect, but it means that you're going to do it to the best of your ability. Join us at the River on Wednesdays and Sundays for weekly services, as well as great programs for kids, youth, and young adults. Visit riveroflifefellowship.org to view our calendar of events. There's something for everyone at the River, where family matters.